Okay. Here we are. We're live and in person uh, for the Airflow Summit. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, it's exciting times. We're rounding out um, a great week of many sessions from across the globe, many in-person sessions as well. Um, and hopefully we can uh, kind of keep the heat going into Friday. Um, today, we're here to talk about Airflow and the Airflow and story. And many times, my friends here uh, in the session with me on the panel and the community has heard, should I use Airflow or this, or should I use Airflow and this? And the community and uh, the folks that we have here all think, think Airflow and, right? And a story I kind of like to tell is um, at, um, you know, a couple years ago, we had somebody come in and say, hey, I want to use uh, Airflow for these workflows, but somebody in my organization really wants us to use Azure Data Factory, for example. Um, we worked with them to say, look, let's use them both. Use ADF for what it's best at, you know, moving large volumes of data, transformations, and use Airflow for what it's best at, scheduling, orchestrating any system anywhere in the world, right? It might be a little aggressive there, but um, that's what we're here to talk to you about. Um, let's run through some um, intros. I'm Brad. I'm on the founding team of Astronomer. Um, have been working with the community here for a few years, just kind of networking, meeting people. Um, driving business for, um, for Astronomer. Um, and today I have some of my friends that I've met throughout the years um, being in the community. And why don't we uh, do a little intro? Um, I'll look to you, Sarah. Sarah, you wanna kind of tell the Airflow community and the summit uh, who you are, what you're working on and um, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sounds great. I'm very happy to be part of this today. So looking forward to it. Um, yeah, my name's Sarah Johnson. I've been doing um, like data world things for about 10 years. And I've been doing ETL development and data warehousing type things for about six years and about three with Airflow, Airflow directly. Um, so right now I'm a senior data engineer at uh, Zipline. We have an instant logistics platform using um, unmanned aerial drones to deliver medical supplies to um, areas in um, Africa with poor uh, road infrastructure. So. Um, definitely a lot of data <laughs> and uh, a huge need for moving that data around and keeping it all neat and tidy like every other company out there. So um, Airflow is part of our strategy to doing that. Love it. Love it. Amazing business model there. Helping the world um, get access to things that they need um, when it's otherwise challenged to send it by ground. Um, and um, and now, uh, thank you, Sarah. Now on to uh, Alessandro. Hello. Hi, Brad. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Alessandro. I am the VP of data at Preply. We also have helped the world to get what they need, in this case, to learn languages, mostly. We are a marketplace for online tutoring. Uh, I, personally, I have been doing uh, business intelligence for a uh, best part of 20 years. And I was uh, lucky enough to have the opportunity to build and scale uh, the data function at multiple startups. And I have to say that I put uh, Airflow in all of them <laughs> at least since 2015. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, share my experience and hear the one of my peers here. Amazing. Bringing education and tutoring to the world remotely. Uh, and using data to power that. We love that. Um, thank you, Alessandro. Um, and now on to, to our friend Jitendra from across the world coming, uh, radioing in from India. Uh, thank you for joining so late your time, Jitendra. Um, excited to hear uh, who you are and what you've got going on and then um, we'll keep it, keep it rolling. Sure, uh, thanks, thanks Brad for having this uh, session been conducted. So it has been a great pleasure to basically host it in the Airflow Summit. So let me just introduce myself, right? So again, I'm Jitendra Sa. So I am a data engineer by profession. So I basically love playing with data. And that is where I got my career started with the data engineering field. So in my in my past experience, basically I'm involved in both building a data platform, whether it is in terms of batch or the streaming data pipeline. So I have been maintaining a streaming and the batch data pipeline for an organization and basically serve the analytical workload. So while building the platform, right, Airflow plays a very important role uh, for basically a workflow management and have been using Airflow for the last uh, couple of years, I would say. 
and has been great uh, working with the airflow and basically solving the complex workflow problem with it. So great to have. Yeah. Awesome. And bringing value to the world through healthcare uh, using data. Um, that rounds out the panel. Um, we've got a lot of cool people from cool companies doing good things for the world. Um, and the folks that we have on the call are, are using Airflow to power that. So what we wanted to do today is run, in, run through some examples of how the, the three folks here, and maybe I can even uh, bring some anecdotal information in on Airflow and. So what are some of the, you know, kind of the tools that you've used with Airflow that maybe have an orchestrator built in or maybe could be used to schedule jobs or do some of the work that you want to do with Airflow? Walk us through kind of what one or some of those softwares are and um, or services and, you know, kind of your thought process, how you got to the Airflow and insert here story. Um, and if anybody has questions, um, I think you probably know this because we're almost a whole week into the summit, but send them in um, and the organizers will send them to us and we'll, we'll try to uh, cover them. Um, but until then, Jitendra, why don't I call on you first? Um, walk us through your Airflow and story, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, sure, Brad. I think uh, uh, I, I would start the, about the journey of our platform building, right? So when we, as a data engineer, started our data engineering journey, we basically think of the some kind of a traditional kind of a data platform, right? So where all our data is sitting in one place, we break it into target with single tool. So in those times, uh, because of the bandwidth issue or something, we rely on the Pentaho. So Pentaho is basically an ETL uh, perform the data pipelining with the help of drag and drop features, right? So you can just simply drag a source or drag a, a target and you can just create a pipeline, right? So that pretty much works well uh, during the starting phase where you have very less sources and very less data 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 set. Uh, when we started our business, I think we had a very exponential growth down the line and we started seeing the maintenance problem, right? Uh, one is basically Pentaho being uh, single node clusters. We were not able to scale well. Uh, being in the drag and drop features, we are not able to automate much more, right? Every time a human effort is required to do all those pipelining and all. So slowly, I think we started looking on the distributed uh, distributed system and we unboarded all our ETL onto the distributed framework like Spark running on the EMR, right? So running on the EMR was quite uh, quite handful for us. I mean, in terms of scaling the system from ground zero to 10x or 20x growth, right? Uh, so the next challenge, uh, what we were facing was the workflow management, right? So since everyone in the team were very comfortable with doing a drag and drop kind of a pieces, right? So we wanted to have some kind of a code-based kind of a workflow management, which will help us to automate the things more precisely, right? I'm just targeting like not only one pipeline, basically thousands of pipeline to maintain, right? Which can be a config-driven kind of a system. So we evaluated a couple of tools available in the market, and that is where Airflow sits well for us, for our use case, and we onboarded Airflow in our platform. So once we onboard the Airflow, right, uh, we were able to design very complex workflow. So a very simple example is I can write a ETL jobs, I can have a dependency, uh, management. I can have a watermark checks. I can have a lot of lot of handful checks before I can run the actual processing of the data. Right. So one of the workflow what I want to share in this platform is like how we are leveraging Airflow with EMR. Right. So all our all our uh, data processing or the ETL has been being performed on the Spark. And the challenge was like how can we basically create the EMR cluster on demand and execute the things and basically terminate it so that there will be a uh, quite good cost saving, right? So for this, I think uh, Airflow provides a very good uh, providers like the AWS or the Amazon providers, which helps you to uh, spin up the cluster with few configurations being provided, execute the process and wait for, for the tasks to complete and basically terminate it, right? So this kind of a very complex workflow we created with the help of Airflow. And uh, we have been running this kind of a workflow from last one year. So this is how basically we are using Airflow with EMR. That's awesome. So from solving a maintenance problem to an automation problem, while still supporting the team that wants to do drag and drop, you've able to kind of use Airflow and EMR in a beautiful way to have better dependency management, better scale, um, troubleshooting, et cetera. I think that's, 
I think that's interesting. I wish I could see the whole crowd, the millions of people out there watching this to see how interesting they think that is. Um, I guess Sarah and Alessandra, have any, anything to add to that as, as it relates to Airflow and EMR? Totally cool if not, but just uh, see if you guys have anything. Well, I have a brief uh, a similar experience in which uh, during my days uh, back at iForm, uh, we used to uh, use Airflow to coordinate uh, uh, certain jobs that then would spin off uh, EMR instances. And in this case, we would use these to process data in order then to train a machine learning model. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, awesome. I think uh, currently, yeah, currently, right, I mean, not only data engineering, with this, right, it was very easy for us to onboard the data science ML workload, right? Basically, we have some kind of a Kubeflow Bing running for the AI ML part, and they basically run their ML model in the Kubernetes cluster with the help of Airflow Kubernetes pod operator, right? So uh, Airflow not only have the DET, but also help us to onboard the data science team to use, use basically for their data pipelining or might be running the tasks more efficiently. So not only, I mean, data science, we are also targeting to onboard our SRE or the DevOps team, right? Who still relies some kind of a cron jobs to schedule some kind of a job and completely bring into the airflow so that they can manage those more efficiently and also can see the, basically see what is happening, right? For the process. Interesting. Do you see a world where they replaced the cron with airflow or you think they stay with cron and kind of airflow and Cron, uh, I, I would say, yeah, I uh, I would say, I mean, definitely with Airflow, right? You can completely move away from the Cron, right? Because uh, that is what Airflow came with, right? Yeah. And with Cron, you have a lot of challenges. I don't want to again mention those challenges because everyone knows the pain of the Cron jobs yeah. I mean, uh, when Airflow was not there. I could see that. I could see a billboard with what you just said right there. Airflow should replace Cron. I'll, I'll go talk to my billboard people and get that going for us. Uh, no, that's good stuff. Um, Alessandra, let's hear, let's hear about your Airflow and story, mm -hmm. uh, which you guys, which as it relates to Preply and, and your past, um, you know. Yeah. Well, here at Preply, I guess it's a, a very good example of what you describe. Uh, we had uh, a basic uh, data uh, warehousing infrastructure in which we were ingesting data from uh, various data sources into a data lake in uh, S3 buckets. And then as it tends to be, you know, we would ingest this data into Redshift and then do some further processing there. And for these uh, uh, basic scheduling and data warehousing pipelines, we were indeed using Airflow, like I would say half of the known world does. Um, and uh, at some point, like we made a few improvements and a few changes. Uh, we migrated from uh, Redshift to Snowflake uh, which gives us more uh, uh, flexibility and I think personal IPDV superiors in many different ways. And uh, uh, then we wanted to complement our uh, uh, stack with uh, something that would allow us to run machine learning at scale. And uh, after evaluating a few technologies and you know going through the usual process of deciding if uh, building versus client, uh, we decided to go for upgraded our existing data lake to a delta lake, which is something that uh, uh, I would recommend anybody to do regardless, given that it's, uh, it's really quick, uh, surprisingly quick. Uh, we managed to do that in a few weeks, and it has a, a huge amount of advantages. And then we were ready to operate with uh, Databricks. For the ones who don't know, Databricks gives you like a, a bunch of uh, very, very convenient tools uh, to uh, process data with Spark and spinning the required uh, machines to do so, uh, but also uh, a notebook environment to do analytics and data science and uh, uh, machine learning through uh, Python notebooks. As Brad said, uh, it comes with its own uh, little scheduler. And uh, that can be convenient. And uh, I mean, uh, our data scientists find it convenient uh, when they are, you know, exploring or when they are uh, developing uh, or in any case, they need, they need to, you know, quickly refresh a table. But we found it uh, 
obvious since the very beginning that that does not translate to uh, production workloads simply because it does not allow to handle in any way any other dependencies uh, across the stack. Uh, in our case, particularly, what we like to do is that uh, we ingest our data in the Delta Lake. Then from the Delta Lake, we ingest what we need in Snowflake. We do ELT to uh, then process this data, enrich it, create aggregates and all the related transformation. And the results of that, we want to be available back in the Delta Lake so that it can also be used by uh, for machine learning. Uh, our objective was to uh, mirror uh, the whatever is necessary to mirror and have it synchronized across the Delta Lake and the Snowflake. Because likewise, like the, out the outputs of our models, we want them to be ingested in uh, Snowflake so that they can be used for business intelligence and any other use cases. So to this purpose, we built uh, uh, on top of Airflow uh, a synchronization layer. It's quite simple. It can be configured and say, hey, this table here, I like it to be synced there and the other way around. And then uh, we, uh, it was, again, very obvious that there is a lot of dependencies here. So before we can train machine learning models, we have to wait until uh, you know the raw data is available before mirroring, we have to do that. Once it's been processed, we have to take it back before yet another model can consume it. Then we have to write the results. When the results are written, we have to bring them back. So there is like a lot of interdependencies and especially circular dependencies across these uh, three pieces of the architecture. And uh, this is where we saw uh, that, uh, you know, uh, using Airflow for everything uh, was the most uh, convenient uh, and also natural approach to go uh, at it. And that is Preply. Love it. So from ingestion into data lakes, into data warehouses, bringing on Snowflake and then bringing on the Delta Lake. And then you're trying to say, okay, we know the, the data science team wants to use the Delta Lake and all of a sudden, you've got a few different pieces. You know Airflow is the glue between them, which allows you to, one, manage complex dependencies, um, allows you to mirror. And then as you start mirroring, the dependencies get more complex. <laughs> and then you're able to easily have that thread, the fabric, that platform below all of this, or above it, I guess, depending on what you how you want to draw it up. Mm -hmm. That's Airflow. Airflow doesn't care what what is what. It doesn't care if this is a Delta Lake or if this is Snowflake. Um, at all. And so I, that's interesting. I think that's a decently common pattern we've seen out here in the community, right? You, a lot of names everybody's heard, a lot of use cases, but the way you stitch them together and the way you're able to have that observability and what you need to continue to operate at scale, Airflow gives you that. Um, I hope I did a good job at recapping that for you. Um, Jutendra, Sarah, anything, anything to add there? Any experiences you guys have with any of those services or Workload. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, what uh, Alexandra meant, right? Something similar use case uh, we do have uh, working with the Red Save, right? So our use case also something similar. Like once data is available in the lake house, uh, we basically model the data by applying some schema modeling technique and bring the aggregated data in the Red Save based on the reporting use case. Now to get that data right, we have a lot of checks we need to have, uh, do, like kind of a dimensions fact, right? A fact. Uh, a fact cannot be loaded until and unless all the dimension is available, right? So those kind of dependency checks Airflow help us to create and also run the parallel tasks together, right? So that it can move the SLA also. Or I can say it can also group many tasks into a task group that features came with the 2.0, right? So that basically helps you to make your UI more uh, more fancy in terms of looking. And when you click, you see a more details view of it, right? So I think that's a very good example, like where uh, you are bringing a data from one source to another, and you are also having the dependency checks and other kind of a checks that helps us to basically make your workflow more scalable or might be more maintainable, right? So yeah, similar kind of a problem statement we do have. For sure, thank you. Sarah, yeah, I want to hear, also, I want to hear from you, yeah. <laughs> we have the same, um, like, same situation with Databricks and, and data scientists and, and folks feeling really comfortable there and being able to iterate rapidly. But then to your point, as far as productionization, it leaves something 
um, to be desired. So I love that we can take the the Databricks operator and put that into the bigger context with Airflow and to track over time and to synchronize it with other things, things that are happening both within and not within Databricks. And also to create that like ephemeral Databricks environment that's all version controlled and production controlled so that things are easier to keep running smoothly. <laughs> and, and also, but still like that Databricks context being the runtime for that code, it makes the handoff, you know, from data science to data engineering very easy. Um, and it gives them, you know, a familiar um, microcosm to do their part in. Yeah. Interesting. Can, can you go a little deeper on that? And no is a totally okay answer <laughs> on this. Go a little deeper on the handoff that you were talking about from data engineering to data science. Is there any anything deeper you can you can talk about or share with that that maybe we could all jump on um well I, I just think with the with the airflow and story it makes that handoff easier because the the databricks um, runtime is the same runtime that we're going to use in production we're just kicking it off and orchestrating it from airflow versus maybe um, without the airflow and story they're doing their work in databricks and then we're going to have to like completely rewrite it into a python operator it's going to run on a different you know um, a, a different underlying um, environment so I, that's is that maybe what you're yeah yeah that okay. was, yeah yeah that was good um, I guess before I kind of keep going in Jitendra or Alessandra do you have you guys have anything to add on on this I mean this seems like a hot topic in the community these days just Databricks, Snowflake, Airflow, data science, the marriage between data engineering to data science. Um, you guys have anything to add there? Well, uh, what's to add is that it seems to be working uh, uh, extremely well, this uh, kind of solution. Uh, of course, like it's probably not going to be uh, uh, accessible to everyone, uh, depending like on the amount of data that you have to crunch and uh, on the budget that you have. Uh, I mean, if you are a small startup in ad tech, I guess this is not the stack for you since you're going to handle a lot of volume and uh, dealing with very small margins. But like uh, if you are in a company that is uh, could be like preply size or any kind of like, you know, series B, series C startup in which you have a reasonable budget, and at the same time, you have uh, uh, enough data to make it fun, but not too much uh, to make it like uh, very, very complex and very expensive, especially. Yeah. Uh, and this is a choice I would, uh, I would uh, recommend. Like uh, it can get uh, a bit pricey very quickly, like uh, Flake, uh, Databricks, that can be a bit pricey. Uh, but yet again, like the, uh, the convenience uh, and the UX, are really pretty amazing. And uh, uh, the way we uh, sits into it, uh, uh, I mean, it's just not different from uh, handling any kind of pipelines or any kind of data warehousing scenario. I mean, the fact of adding this piece over here, as you said, like uh, Airflow is quite agnostic, you know, so it doesn't really make much of a difference. It's still uh, like a call that runs a job and hears back when the job is done and uh, raises an alarm if the job fails. Uh, there is not really a whole lot more to it. So adding this piece to the infrastructure and having Airflow to coordinate does not quite add much complexity to uh, the, your Airflow implementation. Uh, it would only make uh, probably um, uh, just your uh, schema is a bit bigger and uh, you know your, <laughs> your, your pipe and a little bigger. <laughs> For sure. Question for you guys. How has Airflow 2.0 helped with this specific workflow that we're talking about? And I know, I think it was Jitendra you mentioned something related to sensors. It seemed like something happened. Then the next Airflow sees that, reads that, senses it, and then continues on. Tell us if you guys walk us through a 2.x and beyond or 2. Point whatever version you're on. Like, what, how is that some of the new features of Airflow 2 and beyond helped with? helped with this kind of data engineering, data science um, marriage, I guess, as I said before. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, I think a couple of features uh, I just want to talk about, right? One is definitely a scheduler, right? I can see a very vast difference uh, in terms of scheduling that DAG, what has been in the 1X and also versus 2X, right? And also the highly available scheduler. Before under like, uh, sometimes the scheduler might fail. So it's kind of a single point of failure, like what we used to face in the 1X. And that was being quite resolved in 2X. And I think we have not been uh, facing those kind of issue on the 2x kind of version, right? Secondly, uh, talking about the task group, right? Uh, as I said, like we used to, we used to maintain a lot of uh, dependency checks before I can run any uh, downstream tasks, right? So, for example, if I have to bring a data from the source to a data warehouse, right? A data is coming to a data lake. There will be a multiple layers. Then it will come to the processing layer. Then it will go to the reporting layer, right? So these all dependency checks uh, becomes very complex, like uh, when you start having a dependency on each of the table, right? So task groups plays a very important role. So when I have to talk about the uh, watermark check and the uh, uh, latest record time check, right? So this helps us to basically encapsulate multiple tasks into one so that at least the UI will be quite uh, quite simple. And uh, when we go more detail, it can show us that, right? Coming on to the sensor side, right? So we basically are heavily relying on the S3 sensor and also the EMR task sensor. Uh, so this helps us to understand like whether my tax within the service, right? Because if I have to see Airflow and some other tool, right? So we don't have a direct integration, I mean, a direct interaction with those, right? So what we can do is a kind of a sensor that helps us to identify whether a tax is completed on the uh, downstream or might be the third party tool or not. So that's, that helps a lot uh, for us. And also a S3 sensor, right? I mean, that also plays a very important role for us to uh, basically trigger a, a trigger a task when something arrives on the source, right? So these are the couple of features uh, what really excites me uh, on the in the 2.0. Uh, 2 and I think recently it has been launched 2.3, so not yet migrated to 2.3, but I'm very excited to basically onboard that into 2.3 and leverage the features what I've been building. Nice. That's your weekend project, right? To get everything upgraded to 2.3. Actually, 2.3.1 was released I, maybe this week. So that, that'd that be an easy weekend project for you, to tender. Just email me on Monday. Let me know how it went. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sarah, do you have any do you have any experience with like um, or any thoughts on what Airflow 2 has brought to this this topic? Um, nothing specific. I, I've definitely realized benefits from Airflow 2 as far as the stability of Airflow. Um, but there's nothing that's jumping out to me on this topic um, cool. that's changed much. Yeah. Cool. Come right back to you in a sec. Alessandra, anything to add on what Airflow 2 has changed for you and, and Preply? Sorry, you, you have been breaking up a little. Okay. I just assume that you're asking for my uh, yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, it's been a, a, a few years since uh, I still had the luxury, I repeat the luxury of getting my hands dirty with pipelines. Uh, <laughs> so lately, I'm probably more concerned with providing uh, uh, accurate answers to questions from investors and things on the line. <laughs> uh, again, like uh, I know for a fact that the team uh, received very well the upgrade. And uh, uh, again, yeah, there was talks about stability, and uh, yes, I I heard uh, exciting around the, the sensors as well. Nice. Plus, all the revenue Airflow Two has been generating for Preply, I'm sure you're happy with that. <laughs> 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 right. Life's easy now, right? Um, no, that's good stuff. Um, Sarah, let's hear let's hear about your uh, the zipline um, and your. Um, experience with like Airflow and what do you what do you have a uh, that you want to want to share with us yeah I think I want to go in, and I could there's Airflow and a lot of different things going on <laughs> I think we have a really um diverse mix of data tools that we're using but I think the one I want to focus on is um with Fivetran and DBT in the Snowflake environment so um Fivetran super easy no code click there's a copy of your database and then DBT SQL transforms on top of that and also has some DAG elements of its own that it can do. But what if you want to orchestrate the whole thing from end to end, you know, and you want to have DBT kickoff after Fivetran finishes, right? 
So Airflow allows the linkage, you know, between those two things. And also not trying to um, recreate the, um, the DAG construction that DBT does for us, but just to leverage that, but within a single Airflow task that can then be sequenced into a higher level view of everything where you can include what's going on outside of the data warehouse or outside of a SQL only type environment into a single workflow. Um, so that's been really awesome. I, I've been really um, gotten a lot of chance to uh, be hands on with the DBT and really love the tool and, and just think it's added a ton, you know, but it, it does have its, um, it does have its niche, but then it needs to be fit into a bigger picture. And I think that's where the airflow and story comes in. Very, very cool. Totally get that. Five trend makes it easy, low code, no code um, to replicate, you know, what you need to DBT does its job and then snowflakes sit in there waiting for all the data to come in. And rather than have multiple schedulers, you can have one scheduler, <laughs> or sorry, one orchestration tool, right? And, and it's the fabric that lays um, under or over top of all of those making life easier. Um, so from a five trend DBT snowflake kind of perspective, Alessandro, Jatendra, do you guys have any experience with those? Any thoughts? Well, yeah, the modern data stack. Uh, <laughs> first time I heard about it, like uh, I was a bit surprised by how naive this approach sounded. It's like, you know, yeah, set up your data warehouse in 15 minutes, here, 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 and all that. And I'm like, dude, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you know, like, it doesn't work like that. Okay, you can do it if you are doing a proof of concept. And uh, yes, of course, you can pull your main uh, sources from Fivetran and maybe uh, put a cron to schedule a few aggregation by running some sim simple SQL statements. Uh, and then, yeah, you build an aggregate and uh, you put uh, Looker on top. I love Looker. Okay, so you get your, your uh, but th there is like an MVP. It's probably a very powerful MVP. It's probably going to work for a little time. But yeah, just a matter of time before you bump into something you cannot do. And this something can be something as simple as integrating a data source that Python doesn't cover. So what do you do? Or else uh, you might want to upload some uh, Excel files. And then what do you do? Or else uh, <coughs> uh, very typical is, uh, again, handling more complex uh, uh, more complex uh, dependencies, uh, doing retries if anything fails. Uh, making sure you don't uh, trigger a job that sends a massive push notification before the text is there. You know, like, so, uh, yeah, once again, uh, uh, I see this as an excellent starting point. I, I love uh, uh, the convenience of tools such as Fitran or Stitch or all this. So don't get me wrong, I like it, and we use them regularly too. But again, it's just like uh, something else that fits uh, in the puzzle. You know, and I think uh, one important uh, side of uh, uh, um, airflow that goes a bit overlooked uh, is uh, uh, ingestion. Uh, as long as uh, you know the uh, volumes are reasonable, uh, then uh, it makes for an excellent tool for custom ingestion. And uh, it happens quite often that you need to read from an API that is not that well supported. Uh, and so you're not gonna fight. Like uh, now I have a project for HR and we need to ingest from 15.5, from Greenhouse, from... And so basically it was funny because I was uh, reaching out to the various vendors and each one covered a different tool but didn't cover the other two. <laughs> uh, so in the end, like HR data is very low volume uh, by definition, no? unless you're IBM, you're not gonna have millions of employees. So. Uh, uh, it was quite uh, convenient, simple to make a call to 15.5 and bring down the basics. And, you know, uh, since uh, the very little consolidation uh, and very little cleaning, very little processing to be done, uh, then uh, uh, simply writing a script in Python and schedule it to, you know, then save a text file and then schedule and ingest in, uh, in Snowflake is also pretty nice. Uh, the fact that Airflow is, or, is uh, open source also might uh, allow you to, to spin a separate instance in these cases, like uh, such HR. HR is a very tricky one. 
Uh, and here we see the uh, uh, the power of these new uh, new stacks uh, because uh, you know we were capable of spinning a separate snowflake snowflake instance uh, because we only pay for what we use and in this case very very little you know and uh, also in the case of uh, airflow we managed to spin a tiny instance only to do that and by doing this I have literally nobody in my company who has access to HR data. Just very sensitive as you can imagine. Interesting. Uh, data. To... <laughs> What's that? Wait, what was that? Try and do that with Fivetran. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Keeping data secure and kind of masked or hidden or inaccessible to some team members that shouldn't have access to certain data. That's um, honestly, that's a more, that's kind of interesting. That's first I've one of the first times I've come across that. And I mean, I'm looking at Jatendra and Sarah here. It looks like in both of your businesses, that may be similar too. HR data, yes, but Jatendra in the health space and Sarah and some of the more kind of local data that you're working with, with some of your clients. Like, do you guys find that use case? Not to go on a tangent here, but do you find that use case much? Yeah, I think uh, you, you, mean, you are talking about the data security part, right? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I think uh, definitely uh, data security is very critical for us being in the healthcare domain, right? So there is two way to protect our data. One, basically enabling the data governance, right? Who has access to what and basically restrict the data access to them. And uh, second is basically identifying the PI data and uh, masking or encrypting those data sets so that it is not visible to the wide, uh, to the general audience, right? So we do have a use case where we have to share data across the team, right? But uh, we have added a very uh, proper access policy uh, who can be unloaded for data access and basically control the restriction for them, right? And also the platform, what we have built, right? That do support uh, kind of a data governance to integrate in our system. And uh, second uh, use case is, I think, uh, about the DBT, right? Uh, what Sarah was mentioning, I guess. So uh, I, I do have uh, personally data POC on those, right? So definitely a great tool that basically uh, helps you to write the SQL transformations uh, or kind of uh, ETL jobs or the ELT jobs uh, over there, uh, where you have a data that is sitting in the database and you don't have to load that into memory, which utilize your in, in, in database memory, right? So uh, we also evaluated uh, DBT and uh, somehow I think we did not unboard it because uh, we, we were on the direction to basically have a framework driven kind of architecture, right? Where we created a framework and that basically is capable to replicate the behavior of the DBT. Uh, definitely not entire features or the functionality what DBT supports, but uh, I would say uh, things what we need for our platform to support the ETL kind of jobs, right? So that is what uh, I have experienced work with the DVD. Nice. Thank you, sir. Sir? To circle back on the governance thing, um, definitely, you know, even, even if the data is coming through Fivetran, you know, we always land it in a secure place in Snowflake, and then we'll use DBT to obfuscate or remove, down select, and then put that in the, the logical database that then is connected to the BI tools. Um, but I love your idea, Alessandro, about a totally separate instance of Airflow and a totally separate instance of Snowflake for things that are super secure like HR. That's a really good call. And to your point, it can be very cost effective and not too much headache to do something small like that in small data volumes. Yeah, I mean, I would recommend it for this kind of extreme cases. Like the problem I was facing uh, was quite simply that, uh, you know, uh, even uh, if we put all the security in place, that I would have a, a data engineer such as you or uh, the head of data operations, and these people would have access to my wages, the CEOs, my performance, <laughs> <laughs> the performance of everybody else in the company. So there was something that we simply could not do. Uh, the, in this case, uh, we, we cooperated with uh, an external partner. And we got this external partner to do uh, like the basic development uh, on the Looker side, uh, on the Airflow side, and on the uh, Snowflake side. And so, but the problem was still that if we did this on our instance, then uh, uh, the administrator of this instance would have access to it and there's no way around it. 
So that was the reason why we spinned off a separate instance. I would say that, again, it's an extreme case. And uh, also, I would uh, balance out uh, the complexity of it uh, that you introduce. You know? So in this case, this is doable uh, because it was a uh, uh, very low complexity in terms of transformation on everything that we have to do. Awesome. Data governance brought to you by the Airflow and Story, huh? Got another mm -hmm. billboard? <laughs> um, cool. Um, anybody have anything else to add over the, the three kind of examples of an Airflow and Story uh, that we covered so far? Just to recap, kind of taking drag and drop and solving maintenance and automation problems as you en route to production. Dependency management is a kind of a, um, a common thread we've heard throughout all of them is when you go to production, dependencies get more complex and more important um, and managing them becomes more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, from ingestion to a data lake, data warehouse, synchronization, I think is a, is a word I pulled out of there. I think that's, that's an interesting use case that I'd imagine we're gonna see more of over the next couple of years. Um, I doesn't mean much, but I haven't run into synchronization as much as I have some of these other use cases. Mm. Um, so maybe let's let's focus in on that. Synchronization powered by Airflow. And Alessandro, that was kind of part of your, um, I think that was part of your uh, Airflow mm. and story. So Sarah, Jitender, do you guys have a synchronization kind of use case or any thoughts on the, the and story with that? So the idea is no, I think you move your yeah, data, ahead. move data from lake to warehouse, back to lake, back to warehouse for different, yeah. Um, nothing huge at the moment, but I definitely understand the utility and the, um, the underlying, you know, mm -hmm. reasons why to do such a thing. Um, I can also see it like, like you, to your point, Alessandro, about it becoming uh, quite circular. How do you kind of control for that, like, stopping that from turning into a, a potential uh, train wreck. <laughs> well, um, I would say, first of all, uh, we don't do this with everything. Uh, we do this with certain uh, key pieces of the architecture. And that's needed quite uh, for one specific use case that, uh, you know, uh, training machine learning models on by pulling data directly through uh, a data, from a database is it works on very small volume. You know, you, you can use a Snowflake connector, it's gonna work, but you're not gonna get the most out of it. So like Spark likes it when you process data with, uh, uh, um, from uh, parquet files. And so that's why this, this data was, uh, you know, we it didn't really make sense to have uh, three pieces of architecture, you know? So it makes sense to use uh, the Delta Lake for ingestion and then process the data in Snowflake and then bring back the aggregates there. So, and uh, like, uh, uh, we saw that this piece became uh, quite uh, common, you know, and uh, uh, in terms of, uh, and so it was convenient, this idea of building a, a little application, a simple application that could be parameterized. Simply, hey, I want this table and I want it there. I want this table and I want it there. And it seems to work pretty well. Uh, this does not increase a lot uh, the, uh, I think in terms of dependency, uh, the, the replication itself. Uh, then we have to put, a, where we have to put a little bit of care is uh, where do we put the trigger to train a certain uh, machine learning model? Uh, normally what we do is we put it at the end of the pipeline. Uh, and so that we can make sure that everything is in, uh, is in place by the time it runs. And then we might consider anticipating it in case maybe uh, we are doing some uh, operations down the line that are not really that relevant to the modeling question. Uh, and that's like the kind of dependency. Then once the model is trained, uh, then we can output the prediction of the model. And then this prediction of the model will feed them back. The thing is that you know the prediction of the model are, don't need to be brought back again. And that's where the circle is breaking. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, 
yeah i think alexander i partially agree on the architectures what uh, you have been mentioned right so i have a similar use case uh, here uh, we also serve the data science use case right uh, but how we serve is uh, you mentioned about the delta lake right and that is basically provided by the data bricks and it supports the lake house architecture so even we are building the lake house architectures and what we do is uh, whatever aggregated data we instead of keeping in the red shift and pulling back we aggregates the data with the help of spark as i said uh, it can be scaled to n number of nodes and we again load back to the lake house uh, so that basically supports the acid property also uh, so we heavily rely on the apache hudi for building our data lake uh, basically a lake house which is similar to delta lake and uh, this is how basically we solve our uh, yeah. workload to the data science team yeah uh, makes sense uh, it's also a very valid option and a lot of people tend to do that uh, the reason why i opted for the this parallel solution is simply uh, ux uh, and uh, uh, also the fact that uh, it democratizes in creating pipelines across uh, a broader audience within my uh, team That's because uh, uh, well, if you are processing data with Snowflake, uh, Snowflake has a spectacular optimizer, and you don't have to worry about many things in order to make it go fast. It's a database, you know. So whereas uh, when I do Spark, uh, I would have to worry, you know, uh, about how data gets distributed, about data gets together, like according to how you write a SQL query with PySpark or whatever. And, and uh, like uh, uh, Spark UL, uh, depending on how you write it, uh, you can get a job that takes minutes or take a job that takes hours. And that's it, it's the kind of overhead that I wanted to remove because uh, I have junior analysts who are like amazing uh, at, uh, you know, doing analytics. Uh, I want them to be able to create pipelines safely. And I cannot really expect to put a lot of effort into learning Spark or into learning the nuances and caveats of uh, Spark jobs optimization. Well, I, I mean, I could have them too, but I'd rather have them investing their time in other things that bring more value to the business. Uh, oh. This is the reason. And then uh, uh, the second reason is because uh, regardless, even if I do process my aggregates uh, within uh, the Delta Lake in uh, Spark, then uh, I'm going I'm to have to bring them back to my Snowflake instance regardless, <laughs> because I wanted to be able to be consumed uh, with uh, my BI tools, namely Looker. And mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, uh, Databricks, for instance, they're selling uh, their solution as an end-to-end uh, data warehousing, and they tell you that you can use a uh, Connect Looker to it, uh, and that, but for the same reason that I quoted before, I, uh, sorry, call me old school, I'm a bad <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, Spark, on top of, Spark on top of Parquet file is not a columnar database. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, again, it's a different beast. And so I would be rather, uh, uh, I don't think it's a complete substitute for a data warehouse, the same way that Snowflake is not a substitute for uh, a, a Spark processing engine uh, and a Delta Lake. So I would rather get the, the two words. Also, because if you think about it, uh, it doesn't really cost a lot more because you either use one or you use the other. So like the total cost that you put in terms of proce processing is not really that higher. Like maybe the overhead is purely this uh, replication, but like a replication is not processing, it's simply copying from A to B. And also it can be uh, commoditized quite conveniently with this kind of like, you know, reusable, uh, data application that allows you to do so. And if you don't want to use do that, you can also use Stitch you know, to, to, to synchronize. So that's why we, we went this way about it. OK. Yeah, I mean, completely agree uh, what problem uh, you're trying to solve, right? But uh, what I see here is the overall maintenance over it, right? So once you get the data into a snowflake or uh, somewhere, you also have to think about the archival policy, right? Because you cannot hold the data duplicate on two particular sources. So you have to, uh, do you have any archival policy that is enabled on the Snowflake? Because I can see your data being synchronized from source to the target, right? Sorry, Chitana, I didn't understand. Would you please rephrase? OK. Uh, OK, my question was, uh, you mentioned about the data replication between a Delta Lake and the Snowflake, right? Uh -huh. So I can clearly see a data duplicacy that is sitting in two places, right? 
So is there any archival policy that is enabled on the Snowflake so that you maintain the cost on the storage side also, right? Definitely, when you deal with the small volume of data, cost will not matter. Uh-huh. But if I have to talk about petabytes of data, right, that will definitely cost us. Uh, okay, it makes complete sense. Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, this kind of replication that I uh, describe is done uh, mostly on aggregates. So volume is very low by definition. So I don't have to move petabytes. If I have to move petabytes, I have a problem. <laughs> so, uh, what I feel like, for instance, I would uh, uh, create uh, your typical summary table in which for each uh, user and each day I and each uh, and their attributes store a bunch of metrics. So this table is going to be a table that is going to be a few hundred gigs at the very worst. So replicating this one back is not much of a problem. Likewise, uh, what I'm replicating back to uh, Snowflake could be the results of uh, an LTV uh, prediction model. So that's like one record per customer. So that's going to be a table that probably thousand. <laughs> it's going to have like a number customer probably has right now, but like we have uh, probably 200,000 uh, active learners every month, you know, so that's it. So that would be like a very, very low volume. Uh, that's on one hand. And on the second hand, again, I am in this beautiful situation. The probably is uh, one of those companies that has uh, enough data to be fun, but not uh, enough to yeah, be worried about stuff. <laughs> okay. And interesting. I think, uh, yeah. I mean, if it is aggregated data, then completely makes sense uh, to do that. I agree on that. Nice. Should we set up a monthly session with the four of us and get together to talk about now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, Sarah, before I kind of jump on to another um, question or whatever, did you have anything to add uh, to what we just said? Totally. totally fine. Uh, I don't. Not, not, not really. No, we, we used a little bit of this like from warehouse to lake back to warehouse pattern um, when I was at Rover. We're using Redshift cluster, um, and they did use a uh, ETL orchestration to keep them, you know, keep keep that synchronicity happening. Um, but it wasn't directly with Airflow. Nice, got it. How have the providers and provider packages changed the Airflow and story for you guys? Or one, or I'm assuming you're familiar with providers. A safe assumption. Um, but have you guys used those? Has that, has that enhanced the Airflow and story, made it easier, made it you know more challenging, I guess? Um, but anyways, how, how's that changed the landscape for you guys? Yeah, I think uh, if I have to look on the provider side, right? I think before Andal, uh, we used to have this set of operators, right? Like being created. And we basically, I basically work on creating the custom operator more since uh, the kind of a workflow or kind of a pipeline I need will be quite different than what is being provided. So uh, I love creating a custom operator based on the use case. And we have like plenty of custom operators that is being running in the product of this one. But when this provider's concepts came, right, I think each, uh, each basically provider has its own operator. And that basically serves certain use case, right? So for me, I think currently AWS are providers, right? Which basically provides a plenty of operators to interact with their services. So I don't have to write a custom operator for those and basically creates and uh, everything, right? So I can find everything. So it's like, if something is already present, why should I code, right? So that is one way that is helping us. Uh, second one, I think uh, related to all other database operator, right? Whether it is a MySQL or Postgres, right? Uh, I can easily build a self-service kind of a platform, right? Where I can basically give a operator to my uh, end users. And if they wanted to schedule, right, they can just schedule the jobs or the schedule the DAG with few parameters being configured as a YAML file or something kind of a JSON file. So this way, I think provider has changed the, changed the way how Airflow works. And basically for me, it's like write, uh, I mean, write, uh, write less code and do more, right? That is what I did. <laughs> You've got two potential billboards, uh, or three, just two in that last comment. If something is already present, why would I code? <laughs> uh, and then I actually just blanked on the last one you just said. That was good. If you remember, let me know, and I'll, I'll send it into my billboard guy. Um, and we'll get those things all over the all over the world for us. Um, Alessandra, I know you got to. You said you got to jump here in a couple minutes. Um, 
what about you? What about you and the team? Um, providers changing anything for you guys there? Um, look, uh, I don't have a, a, that, that degree of detail, so probably a good question for my head of data operations. <laughs> <laughs> bring them in, bring them in. Are they right behind the door. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, um, yeah. Let's talk to them. Got it. Sarah, you guys getting into providers uh, much there at Zipline? Well, we're using the Databricks provider for sure um, to handle the Databricks submit stuff. Um, and other than that, I'm not 100% up on what the difference is between one to two as far. I think, you know, there was always um, like pieces of Airflow operators and, and um, hooks that was maintained by um, third parties. So now it seems like there's more formality to it um, and perhaps the, you know, community adoption of it has improved as a result of that. Um, but the Databricks one is the only one that I've, we're directly using right now. Got it. It's working great. And yeah. like to, 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 to Jitendra's point, why would I code it if it's already working great out of the box? Exactly, exactly, yeah. That's what's exciting. Everybody at Astronomer and, and a lot of the people we're talking about too in the community Providers are just making, you know, the airflow and story more amplified, easier. And as that continues to evolve and develop, it should get a lot more, you know, version control, I'll have a lot more community input. Um, and for those that are watching, registry.astronomer.io is a great place. It's about all airflow, no matter what airflow you're using, that should have stuff for you. Um, and it's cool because it's an easy way to search for provider packages. Um Cool. We're getting down to the last few minutes. Um, my, how time flies when you're having fun. Um, I guess any other parting, I mean, Alessandra, I know you got to go. So any, any parting words or anything you want to say um, related to airflow? I, airflow I and, <laughs> what's that? I hope we we'll see, I, I hope, hope see you again. So, yeah. yeah. Soon, you and our friends here and everybody. Uh, well, nothing. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity today. It was uh, nice to be able to bounce idea and uh, hear uh, things and making sure that uh, we didn't do it too wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what we do makes sense. Uh, got uh, some very interesting, uh, uh, inspirational content from uh, everybody here. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank uh, you, Brad, and uh, Astronomer for the opportunity and the for Summit. And uh, looking very much forward to do this again. Awesome. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Have you. a great day, and we'll speak to you soon. Have a great bye -bye. weekend. Okay, Sarah. Bye. -bye. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> bye. Uh, Sarah, any uh, parting words? Anything you want to just kind of drop in? Airflow and this is a big topic, of course, but do um, you have anything? Just uh, thanks for the opportunity. This was really fun. I'm looking forward to more good stuff. And I definitely think, yeah, I, it's for me, the Airflow or is not really an option. You know, there's a lot of these tools that really have their niches and every tool wants to be all things to all people, but that's not <laughs> practical. <laughs> so I'm, I'm much of the mindset of, you know, putting it into a, a larger tool strategy. Yeah. For sure. That that billboard will go right on the other side of the Bay Bridge as you're coming into <laughs> SF. It'll just say, Airflow or is not an option by Sarah, by Sarah Johnson. Oh. Zip line. <laughs> uh, but thank you for joining. Um, and Jitendra, we've got a, about a minute left. Anything you want to share with the community, share about your, your story? Yeah, sure. I think uh, thanks, thanks for again conducting this. Again, this is very useful talking with the professionals like how they are using Airflow with other tools. And Definitely going to help me if in futures, I am basically uh, going to depend on those tools for my data engineering building, right? So I think uh, what I can add here, right? I mean, uh, just to add on the airflow side, right? So uh, what I was also looking on the airflow is as a version control, like what you have mentioned about the providers. So if that kind of a version control can be enabled with the airflow, right? It's very easy for us to roll back and basically come to the point like where the DAG was working. So that's something very interesting features. Uh, I'm also targeting to see the community will come over. And I think everyone is facing those challenges. And let's see how, how next it goes. So, but yeah, very happy to be in this session and learn from the community. Awesome. 
Well, everybody, the community, Jitendra, Sarah, and Alessandro, thank you guys all for joining. Uh, they joined from um, the West Coast in the U.S., from Spain, and from India, and I'm out of Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, the greatest Cincinnati region anyway. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Be safe out there. Um, and airflow to the moon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.